So this morning we're going to continue on our track of, of going back. Uh, we, we've talked about going back to different things. This is a time of year when, you know, summer vacation ends. And the first week we talked about going back home and, and what our home lives should look like, what we can do to make our home lives um, a, as good as they can be. And then last week we talked about going back to school and preparing ourselves, whether we have children or not, there's children in our lives, there's children here at the church, and we talked about the Ten Commandments of going back to school, uh, which you can apply to a lot of other areas of your life, um, but specifically about going back to school. I know school started, what, Tuesday and Wednesday, depending on what school district you're in this week. So we got kids back in school. I've noticed that traffic, you know, around 3, 3.30 gets a little crazy here in town again uh, as, as people are going to pick up kids and school buses are driving around and things like that. And today we're going we're gonna to talk about the next thing that we go back to, and that is going back to work. We, we all have times in our lives when we go back to work. And maybe if you're like a teacher or a school administrator, you've had several weeks off the summer and vacation's over, you come back home, uh, your kids go to school and you go back to work. Uh, but we also go back to work sometimes maybe we had a period of unemployment. There's a time that we had between jobs and we're hoping to find a job and we're looking for a job and we finally find one and that day comes when it's time to go back to work. We also do it, um, maybe sickness. I've kind of experienced that this last week. You, you might get sick. You might be sick for a few days. You might have a significant illness that knocks you out for a little while. But maybe you recover, you get feeling better, and then you go back to work. So this morning... I want to talk to you about going back to work, but the first thing I want to talk about with regards to work is to, to hopefully um, set your mind at ease or help get you to realize that we were made to work. People were made to work. Uh, it talks about it in Genesis 2. God, it talks about God planted the garden and then He made humans and He put them in the garden. It says to work and to care for the garden. He had planted the garden, got it all growing and nice and pretty and everything like that, and then he put people in there to work it. And at this time in creation, work was not this laborsome, toilsome, difficult kind of thing. And, and it's hard for us to, to, to come to grips with that, right? I mean, because there's, there's things about work that are difficult. No matter how much you enjoy your work, there's probably aspects about it that are challenging, that are difficult, that are maybe a struggle someday. I mean, some days you have great days, and other days you have like, man, that was not a great day, right? We kind of we kind of go to work and we we push through the obstacles that we find in our work life. I think we can also really connect with this idea that we were made to work because if you've ever not worked for a significant period of time, you ever notice how you kind of get anxious? Or you kind of get, I mean, sometimes it starts off as boredom. It starts off with like, woo, I don't have to work, right? It's like, great, get to relax, and, and resting is definitely an important thing that we need to do. We don't need to be workaholics. We don't need to overwork. But we, if we don't work for a day, we're like, okay, that's, that's a day of rest. We don't work for another day, we're like, okay. Well, we keep not working and not working and not working, especially if you've ever been like between jobs where you're really looking for a job. It, it, it begins to wear on you. It like begins to wear on your, your soul. It, it wears on just everything about you. And what is it? Why does that wear on us that way? It's, it, it has something to do with like purpose. You know, what, is my, what is my purpose? There's something within us, something built within us, that we have this desire to work. Now, we don't want and we hope that work is not toilsome and laborsome. That came about because of the event that we call the fall creation decided, decided to revolt against God and this event called the fall where sin entered the world really just messed everything up. And that's part of the reason, that's really the main reason why work is toilsome and difficult. We can see this in Genesis chapter 3 uh, when God's talking to, to Adam uh, in verse uh, 17, in the middle of that verse, it starts off, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, 
And you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat food until you return to the ground. By the sweat of your brow, thorns and thistles will be produced. You are going to have to labor now for this food that you're going to eat. Now, I suspect that most of us, if not all of us, do not labor the ground for the food that we're going to eat, right? We go and labor the aisles at the grocery store. That's what we do. We go and fight, and we run into this person that's mean and angry, and we go, that's a thorn, and we move away from them, right? And we go to this other person who's taking the last jar of peanut butter off the shelf, and we go, that's a thistle, and I'm going to fight against it because that peanut butter should be mine. Right? That's, well, not exactly like that, but you get the gif. The, the gif? <laughs> You get the gist. Um, So we, we, and and that's obviously an oversimplification, but even in our work lives, right? We have these difficult days. We have these struggles. We have things that push against us. Thorns and thistles in this verse is not only literal. There's literal thorns and thistles and weeds and grass and everything that grows up where you don't want it to grow when you're trying to grow food. But also in our labor, in our lives, in our work, whatever our, our vocation is, whatever we do to earn a living to make money so that we can go to the grocery store and fight the aisles and and get food whatever we do there's also metaphorical thorns and thistles in that there's always something and it's not every day every way every occasion or whatever but they come and go in our lives come and go in our work where we run up against this obstacle right You, you you've experienced it probably recently there's some obstacle You're trying to accomplish something, something that's good, something that's noble, but there's something in the way. There's something in the way. Something is thwarting you. Something is fighting against you. It could be another person. It could be a procedure. It could be a lack of knowledge. It could be lots of things. But you've got to fight against this to get this thing done that you're trying to get done. That's the thorns and thistles in your work. It's there and it frustrates you, and it's there because of sin in the world. Later in, Galat- or in Genesis chapter 5, you get this genealogy that goes from Adam to Noah. And it's kind of, it seems like a very disinteresting chapter because you read so-and-so lived and had a son, and this is his son's name, and then this person had many other sons and daughters, and he lived a total of this many years, and then he died. And it just goes on with this rhythm. It's like the, this person lived this many years and then they had a son and this was the son's name. They also had many other sons and daughters and they lived for this many years and then they died. And this just goes on and on and on for like nine or ten generations. Well, and about the ninth or tenth generation, in Genesis 5.28, we get to this guy named uh, Lamech. And it says, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. And he named him Noah. A lot of us have heard of Noah. The word Noah or the name Noah sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for comfort. And that's why he named him that because he says, he will comfort us, get this, in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground that the Lord has cursed. Nine, ten generations later, and these are like long, these guys aren't having kids till like 185. So this is like a long, 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 long time after this whole thorns and thistles curse thing. Nine, ten something generations later, they still realize that the reason labor, the reason work is difficult is because the ground has been cursed. And this guy has this kid and he says, maybe this guy is going to help us out. Maybe this guy is going to bring some comfort. Sort of does in a way, sort of doesn't in a way. But that's what people are looking for. I think that's what we're all looking for. We're looking for some relief from the toil of our work. Today I'd like to give you three things related to your work that are connected to the ultimate Savior, which is not Noah, but is Jesus. Three things that are connected to Jesus and your work. Number one, your work for the Lord is not limited to your work with the church. Your work for the Lord is not limited to your work for the church. You know, following Jesus is not about going into full time ministry. Following Jesus is not like I I hear this message, the good news, the gospel. I hear this message. I accept it. I say, you know what? That's truth. I'm going to follow that. I'm going to pour myself into that. 
I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm going to get baptized. And the next thing I have to do is go be a missionary. That is not expected of everyone. That is the call of some people. But that is not the expectation of everyone. You know, when we partner with God and with others to, to make the world a little more the way it's supposed to be, we talk about that here a lot, this includes partnering with Jesus in our work. Whatever our work, whatever our vocation may be. Partnering with Jesus in work is not just about signing up for church activities. Signing up to be a teacher, we're having a teacher training meeting. Signing up to uh, serve communion or to work on the AV team, to be part of the security team, to be a lockup person, or any of the other many things that we might have going on here. All of those are good. All of those are noble tasks. I want to here, take a little commercial break here because I want to make sure you're not missing my point. I'm not saying that we don't need you to sign up to be teachers, lockup people, AV people, prayer people, whatever it may be. I'm not saying we don't need you. We need you. We need you. <laughs> right? We need you to do those. But those are not the capstone of following Jesus. Those are not the capstone of following Jesus. Partnering with God and others to make the world a little more the way it's supposed to be includes what you do outside of these church activities. Because if, you, if what you do out there is not godly, it kind of doesn't matter what you do in here. If what you do out there is not godly, it really doesn't matter what you do in here. Ultimately, there should be no distinction between what we would call the secular and the sacred. The secular and the sacred. We, we look at what we do here on, on Sunday mornings when we come together, we have a time of worship, we take communion, we have some prayer, we hear uh, an amazing lesson, hopefully. And, and we look at that and we go, that is sacred. That is, that is sacred. And it is. But there should be no distinction between what we do Monday through Friday or Saturday or whatever days we work. Maybe some people are going to work this afternoon. Maybe you're going back to work this afternoon as soon as you get out of here. There shouldn't be any distinction between those. We try to do it in our minds sometimes. We say, this is sacred. This is secular. This is what I do to worship and please God. This is what I do to earn a living and to put food on the table. There should be no distinction between the two. Because what we do here is holy. What we do here is sacred. What we do here is an effort to, to please God, to worship God, to bring honor to God. It also uplifts ourselves. There is value for us as well. But what we do in our work life should also be there to please God, to worship God, to bring honor to God. And hopefully other people around us get something out of that as well. It's just as much a part of our walk with Jesus as any other part of our life. Number two, your work, whatever your vocation is, is a calling from God. Tim Keller said that, he says all work, all work is a call from God. In Colossians 3, uh, he, Paul is talking, and he also talks about this, almost the exact same words in Ephesians. He's talking to, to slaves, uh, and there's this slave-master relationship, but we can definitely uh, insert in there uh, boss, employee, supervisor, and I don't know, underling, <laughs> manager, and worker B, whatever kind of structure you want to you want to set up there. Um, but he says in, in Colossians 3.22, he says to obey your earthly masters, and it's important there that he says earthly, because there's a distinction between your earthly master and your heavenly master. Your earthly master is only going to be around for a little bit. Your heavenly master is going to be there forever. Long after your earthly master is gone, Jesus is still going to be there. But he says obey, though, your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is upon you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. That that's the way we should work because our work, whatever it is, is also part of our calling from God. 
Now, why should we do that? Why should we do this with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord? Because every task, every task for the Christian, no matter how secular, no matter how menial it may seem, falls within the Lordship of Jesus. Everything that we do falls under the umbrella of the Lordship of Jesus. Martin Luther got a hold of this idea back in the Reformation movement a long time ago. And he said something to the effect of this, that the milkmaid... So you're talking about what was, what was a low position in their society, the milkmaid. The milkmaid has just as honorable a calling as the priest and the preacher. That's what Martin Luther said. The milkmaid has just as honorable a calling as the priest and the preacher. You know, in our society, we look at these different jobs and we try to say this job, you know, we, we put them on, um, oh, what do you call it? There's like a, like a strata. There's this, there's this kind of pecking order. There's this hierarchy. And we say, these jobs are up here and these jobs are down here. You know what I'm talking about? All right? The, these jobs are high-class jobs. We call them white-collar jobs, right? I guess we call them white-collar because their collar doesn't get dirty. I don't know. Why do we say white-collar and blue-collar? Anybody know? I don't know. You can tell me later. Educate me. I always get assume white collar because they're wearing white shirts and they never get dirty, right? Blue collars wearing, you know, like a mechanic shirt. <laughs> I don't know. But that's kind of the idea. White collar shirts. We look up, or white collar jobs, and we look at those and we go, we go, that's, that's a prestigious job. That's a noble job. That's a job to aspire for. But then we look at these other jobs and we go, oh, custodial work. Oh, garbage collection. Oh, waste, sanitation, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not really a job, a job to aspire to. That's not a job that's really important. That's not a job that I want my kid doing someday. Have you ever forgot to take the trash out? All right, we've all forgot to take it. Don't, I don't know if everybody's like me who comes once a week on Tuesday. Tuesday morning, like crazy early Tuesday morning, like you better have it out Monday night or they're going to go on without it, right? But you ever forgot to take your trash out, right? What happens So, like the next week before trash day is coming, your, your trash can is, is getting full, right? And you're trying to figure out how you can get that lid down just a little bit more. You can get a little bit more trash in there. Maybe you're starting to collect bags, right? You got one or two bags lined up in the garage that like after they take the trash and it comes back and it's empty, we'll throw them in there. Now imagine what would happen if the trash collection people just stopped coming around. They just stopped coming around at all. So take your, I forgot the trash one week, and maybe you're a real goof up like me and you forgot the trash two weeks in a row, and bags are starting to collect around your house. You're, you're putting them in the garage because you really don't want them in the house. Some of them are starting to get a little stinky. You don't want to put them outside because the dogs will get them, right? The dogs are little critters or whatever that lives in in the woods out here, we'll, we'll tear them up and they'll be just, I mean, we had a bag get out of the trash can one time and there was stuff everywhere, right? You've all experienced that. I've seen a few yards that look like the trash collection people need to come just like pick up the whole yard and take it away. Now just imagine that we continuously collect and collect and collect more and more trash. Our garage is full. We can't, we can't put any more trash in our garage. And it begins to spill out into our driveways and our driveways out into the streets and our whole society is filled with garbage. Tell me, how important is the garbage collection people? Let me ask you another question a different way. Would you say, we talk about the world being a little bit more the way it's supposed to be if we're partnering with God and Jesus and others to, to make the world a little more the way it's supposed to be. Let me ask you a question about how the world should be or a little more should be this way. Would you agree with me that the world should have less sickness in it? Would you agree that if the world was perfect, if the world was really the, God, the way God intended it to be, if the world was free from sin and all the things that man does to turn their back on God, that there should be less sin or less sickness in the world? Would you agree to that? That sickness is kind of part of this fall and everything? Part of what trash collection people do and part of what custodians do is they help keep us clean. Because when we don't pick up our trash and when we don't clean up after ourselves, sickness just thrives. 
th sickness thrives. Back in the Middle Ages, part of some of the big diseases they have and sweeping through, I mean, trash collects rats and rats carry disease and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just this chain of events that happens. You go back to the Middle Ages and there's like the Black Plague and Bubonic Plague and all this other kind of stuff that happened that wiped out like half of countries and things like that because they were filthy, filthy, filthy people. Tell me that trash collection and that custodial work is not important. In the Scripture in Ephesians that Paul talks about this, one thing he says uh, about masters, he says, masters, treat your servants the same way. This, this way with honor and with respect. And then he says, because one, you have a master in heaven, and two, because that master is no respecter of persons. That master, Jesus, does not look at people and go, oh, you're a lowly this person. And look at you and go, whoa, you got this white collar job. That's so cool. When it comes to God, it's even playing field. And when it comes to Christians, it should be the same way. Number three, work, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, work as if working for the Lord. Work as if working for the Lord. In Colossians 3, the next verse says, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And he's not talking about church work. He's talking about servants, slaves serving their masters. And we parallel this in our day and age. And He's talking about employees serving their employers. He's talking about worker bees doing what they should do for their supervisors or their bosses or whatever the case may be. When you are serving, when you are working for your boss, you are actually working for Jesus. And it's, it's a mindset that we have to get in. I am working for Jesus in doing this. A lady named Dorothy, Dorothy Sayers, she wrote an essay called Why Work? <laughs> Why Work? It's a question a lot of us have. Why Work? Well, besides the obvious. Why do I have to work? Why should work be a part of this? And in this, she talks about uh, the intersection of, of faith and work. The intersection between religion and work. And she says this, how can anyone remain interested in a religion, and she's specifically talking about Christianity here, how can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of their life? Nine-tenths of their life spent working, working, working. How could people stay interested in a religion that seems to show no concern for it? She says the church's approach to, let's say, a carpenter, for example, is usually confined to this. She says, so take a person that's a carpenter. The church's position is usually limited to this. Encouraging that person to not be drunk and disorderly in their leisure time and to come to church on Sunday. That that's, that's the church's approach to a carpenter, someone whose profession, whose vocation is carpentry. Mostly what the church says is, don't be drunk and disorderly on your off time and come to church on Sunday. Is that, what about the other nine-tenths of my life when I'm like building stuff out of wood? She goes on to say, what the church should be telling the carpenter is this, that the very first demand of his religion the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. That the first demand of a carpenter by his faith, by his religion, by his faith in Christ, the first demand that that community should make upon the carpenter is that he make good tables. And that, that goes for all of us. If you know, we talk about going back to work and, and the end of summer and going back to school. If you're a teacher, if you're a teacher and you're a Christian, if you're a Christian teacher, the first demand of your life is to be a good teacher. If, if, you're, if you're a banker, the first demand of your faith, if you're a Christian banker, is to be a good banker. If you're a student, maybe your job is, is going to school right now, is to be a good student. If you're a homemaker, it's to be a good homemaker. Whatever it may be, if you're in law enforcement, 
If you're in law enforcement, the first demand of you for that nine-tenths of your life that you're spending working as a Christian in law enforcement is to, is to be a good cop. So if you're ever in the situation where you're like, good cop, bad cop, you've got to be the good cop. I'm just telling you, you've got to be the good cop. You can't be the bad cop. You've got to get somebody else who's not a Christian to be the bad cop. Um, obviously not in the good cop, bad cop situation, but we need in our professions to not separate, sep, separate or segregate this idea of what's sacred and what's secular. They are one in the same if we are people who claim the name of Jesus. Work as if working for the Lord. Now, what if I have a bad boss? Some of y'all may be thinking about that. What if I have a bad boss? What if I got this person that's a jerk that I just can't stand that is always riding me for absolutely no reason? I know it's difficult. But remember, we talked about this several months ago if you were here. If you accept, if, if I accept that Jesus died for me, a sorry, no good sinner, if I accept that Jesus died for me, then I also accept the fact that Jesus died for everyone else, including my sorry boss, who's a jerk. And if Jesus thought that boss was important, then how should I treat that boss? The golden rules, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Not as they do unto us, but as we would have them do unto us. When we become a Christian, one of the things that we do is we become united with Christ. We talked about this too around that same time. You know, we talk about baptism. We're baptized into the name of Jesus, right? This being baptized into is in unity with. Further up in Colossians in 3.17, it says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. He says, whatever you do, whether it's something that you say or it's something that you do, do it in the name of Jesus. Do it in unity with the reputation of Jesus so that when you are at work, doing your work, engaging with a boss who's not that great or whatever, that you should still behave and act and work in a way that is in unity with the reputation of Jesus. Your reputation should be the same, the reputation of Jesus. Work as if working for the Lord. Part of gospel living, part of following Jesus is realizing that the Lordship of Jesus permeates every aspect of our life. There is no distinction. There is no separation. There is no segregation between that which is sacred and that which is secular. Not for the Christian. There is no distinction or separation between those things. The Lordship of Jesus permeates every aspect of our life. It permeates our value system. What we hold as value. Right? Is it, is it money? Is it wealth? Is it collection of assets? Is it stuff? Or is it people? and trustworthiness, and love, and honor, and respect. It permeates our relational standards, how we treat other people. It permeates our social stratification. The lordship of Jesus as a Christian should permeate down to how we view different people. People of different levels of wealth, different economic status, whether you're at the top looking down or you're at the bottom looking up, however you want to do it. I mean, I wish it just wasn't that way, but that's the best way to describe it. The, the way we view people of different ethnicity, the way we view people of different gender, the lordship of Jesus should permeate into every aspect of our life, including social stratification. And the last one, it should permeate into our vocation, into whatever our work is. What we do, whatever it is, what we do to make a living or what we do uh, to, to bring value to our lives and to other people's lives, the Lordship of Jesus should permeate into that because your work for the Lord is not limited to your work with the church. Because your work is a calling from God. And because we're going to work as if we were working for the Lord.
the Lordship of Jesus to permeate down into our vocation, whatever that may be. So I encourage you this week to, to see your work, not just this week, but going on, to see your work not as secular, but as sacred. To see your work as part of your walk with Jesus. And whatever you do, the way you conduct yourself, the way you behave, the way you work, is a reflection of Jesus. Okay? Let's pray and we'll be done. Lord, thank You for blessing us and for honoring us. We thank You for Your Son and for His example in our lives. And we pray that we will be people who see our work lives, our vocation, whatever we may do, whether we're a homemaker or a banker, whether we're a police officer or a teacher, whether we're a preacher or a business owner, that we will see that the Lordship of Jesus permeates down to those moments in our lives that, that our work is not just secular, that because Christ lives in us, it is also sacred, and that we will honor You with our work. Be with us and help us to, to be Your people, to make the world a little more the way it's supposed to be, that we'll partner with others to do the same, and that others might see Christ living in us every day in every way possible in our work and in our play. It's in Your Son's name we pray. Amen.